Welcome to Concussion Talk Podcast. This is episode 77, and I am here just Nick with Aunt Jill Wheatley, who is going to talk about why she is where she is in Nepal and and what she what she what she's doing in Nepal because she is from Thunder Bay. And uh, but first, I will pause for a second to get a word from our my sponsor. Concussion Talk Podcast is presented by HeadCheck Health. HeadCheck Health bridges the gaps in concussion care through simple, powerful technology. To our organizations like the Canadian Football League, Track Factory Racing, the Canadian Junior Hockey League, Eastern Washington University, and Volleyball Canada, who rely on HeadCheck Health to improve communication and optimize care. Visit HeadCheckHealth.com for more. Okay, so Jill... It's so great, so great to meet to meet you, finally. But uh, so why are why are you in? Why is it? What's in a six six thirty there? Six. It's uh, nine a.m. here it, now. It's it's like six something. Some weird time. Yeah, it's, it's almost. It's six thirty. It's six thirty because yeah, because <laughs> nine twelve here. Yeah, and so it's like just a or that's a it's a weird time zone. Well, I mean, doing like Newfoundland itself is a weird time zone. But uh, so where are you now? I'm and in why, Kathmandu you, in Nepal. And where are you in Kathmandu in Nepal? Um, it's a base for the mountains. Uh, as much as I like to uh, be in the mountains, there are times where I need to come back to the city and gear up and take care of things like visas. And uh, that will allow me to get back into the mountains. And so, how long have you sure. been going into the mountains? How long? Uh, Not this time, uh, but just in general. I have been since June 2017, so just over uh, almost three and a half years now. I have been traveling in mountains um, after I set off for one year. So one year has turned into more than about three and a half times as long as I anticipated. And your your website is mountains and your and your Instagram, and Twitter, and Facebook mountains of my mind. And uh, yes. what and. You, why did you start this webpage? What is what is your story that you? Um, starting my website actually took a lot of convincing, and it didn't happen until about um, more than si- about eight months after I started to travel. Um, travel what was, what was the what was the inspiration for this for your the inspiration for your websites and and your and your basically what is basically what is your story? Okay, well, the website, basically, if I can share my story and provide anyone out there with a little bit of light, um, then I I had shifted my perspective um, because at first I thought keeping my story to myself was was just where it was at. Um, However, once I shifted with some convincing, I realized that if I share my story, and anyone who could possibly be in a dark space like I was for so long um, could get a little bit of light, a little bit of inspiration, then it is absolutely worth sharing, worth being vulnerable. And uh, with my authentic tales of the good, the you know, the tough climbs um, internally as, as well as the mountains um, and the bright sunny days as well. You know, I have, I have everything and, and my story is, is very complex. Though not everyone can relate to, uh, like you and I, a brain injury, yeah. every human, I believe, can relate to adversity and and challenges along the way. It's not vision loss. It might, you know, it might be vision loss. It, it, it might be brain injury, but it also could be, you know, dealing with, for example, COVID, just going through dark times and, and struggling to see the light or whether it be um, other other illnesses or struggles with career, etc., I think every every human can connect some way through to to going through dark times like I did. So uh, once I was able to shift my perspective from keeping everything inside to actually sharing it, um, it just seemed like a, a you know possibilities to to help others. And so I went full in. I don't keep anything um, sort of closed. You know, I talk about the real stuff, like the the COVID blues or the Corona blues. It was tough. Yeah, I was here yeah. locked down for eight months. Yeah, your room is um, not that big there. It's... No. And you were saying um, you're in that for a while. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Lockdown was tough, but I do feel like my brain injury and the 26 months I spent in in uh, seven different hospitals prepared me for that. And could so, you could you uh, talk you about to, that? Yeah, I could dude. That a what? Bit. <laughs> I'm reading your, your site there. You you had the the brain injury in 2014, the baseball injury, and in, 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 I'll let you yeah. say it. I'll speak it all better than I will. But uh, sure. yeah, so sure, start with sure. start with that. So I'll like, start it. 2014, um, my everything was was going well. I was an um, so I'm originally from Thunder Bay, but I had uh, traveled extensively. I'm quite uh, I've always been quite athletic, quite adventurous, and uh, at that time I was actually teaching health and physical education, sports science in high in a high school in Germany, so in an international school. Um, I had previously worked in Singapore and oh, sorry, Russia. What, sorry, what did you what did you teach in Germany? Um, health and uh, sport. So basically, oh, okay. in Canada, you call a physical education teacher. Oh, okay. But I also taught like sports science. So in right. some in class. Oh, so kind of works works well for concussions as well. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. I'll sorry. I'll let you um, continue. That's okay. So I was teaching, it was early September, and um, the weather was a little bit overcast, uh, some rain predicted, it was just really damp, and my colleagues um, decided to keep their classes indoors rather than their, the, you know, their physical education classes in, in the gym. However, I prefer to just put on some good gear and head outside, get that fresh air and um, the open space rather than the enclosed gymnasium. So uh, it was a... First lesson of the day, and we I get as excited about sport as my students do. So we had just done a warm up together. We were running around the field. Uh, just imagine Bavaria. You can sort of see the the German Alps, and there's farmers' fields, um, and we have a, a a big open like a soccer pitch basically. And we had it was only the, the third football. week of school. In the first... Football pitch. Oh, sorry, sorry. sorry, sorry. <laughs> Uh, does, soccer doesn't even cross my mind anymore. Um, so we had spent the uh, previous lessons, like lear introductory skills with balls, um, throwing, catching. And on this particular lesson, my goal was to help students learn to connect um, a, a baseball bat and a ball. So they actually had not hand used eye. a bat before. And eye coordination stuff. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. So, so the unit itself. Um, oh, you know, sorry. How, how how old how old are these kids? They're in tenth grade, so about sixteen, oh, okay. fifteen, sixteen. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah, yeah. And do, they play, do they play cricket in Germany? Pardon me? Do they play cricket in Germany? Well, that's an interesting question because the boy that um, I'll tell you a little bit more about one was from India. He oh, is sorry. a very talented cricket player. <laughs> okay, well uh, then, let's just do that. <laughs> And so know. let's put that together. Baseball yeah. bat. Yeah. Uh, he 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 used what he knew with a cricket bat, but hit yeah. a baseball like he would a cricket ball. Okay. Um, life has a funny way of working, and I was standing yeah. at the equivalent of third base um, with okay. a group of students, and the ball that he hit, and he was doing exactly what he was supposed to be doing. He just hit, connected the ball in the wrong direction. Yeah. So. Um, it comes back to late, uh, now, I use the word serendipity. Um, you know, the occurrence of events that ha have happened in the long run in a good way. At this time, I use the word serendipity because I'm super thankful that the ball actually hit me and not one of the 20, stu other 20 students I was yeah. responsible for. Yeah, sure. So at the time, my, my the ball connected with the right side of my skull and uh, my right eye closed instantly. I was taken to hospital, you know, um, obvious sort of in and out my memory. Um, I knew there was something really wrong. Um, I, w I was in a car that felt like I was being like raced uh, in, a, in a race car, but I was in a washing machine and everything was shaking and um, unbearable. Yeah. However, I was told in the emergency after a brief um, analysis that I had a black eye and that my friends could take me home on the farm where I lived in Bavaria. Um, and I had some, 
a, a very small fridge because I lived in a very small apartment. I think like in Canada, it would be like a, a, a hotel or motel little Bachelor? fridge. Bachelor? Huh? Well, yeah. Okay. Uh, but the, the fridge, like super small, oh, like you can't, oh, yeah. you, could, beer you, fridge. you couldn't fit a bottle of beer in it. Oh, okay. <laughs> so not, not, even, not even a beer fridge. <laughs> yeah. So I had a tiny freezer with some frozen berries. Um, and that's what I used to try to soothe yeah. my aching, throbbing head. Um, I didn't have, you know, regular ice. Anyway, those berries um, ceased to melt quite quickly. Yeah, they would. Um, and the bag, the Ziploc bag that they were in was used to, for myself to try to vomit because I couldn't get myself to a toilet, anything like that. And this is in and out of consciousness. Um, and until sort of 36, 36, not quite 48 hours uh, later, a friend was coming to visit um, from the UK, flew in, got to my apartment, and and found me basically pretty much listless where i had been yeah. since 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 the, since coming home from hospital so immediately um back to back to that same hospital um where i was put in an ambulance and taken to a neurotrauma hospital um so uh i was quickly um assessed thoroughly yeah um mris and and um head to toe so my black eye has never reopened i'm 70 percent blind and mm -hmm. i my skull was fractured and my brain was bleeding and swelling while i was home alone mm -hmm. so that um i mean i could the the details just like like your story in and out of different hospitals and and tossed between different specialists and brain injuries are so complex at the time my the focus was on controlling the bleeding and swelling right my eye would reopen i was told uh once the bleeding and swelling cleared my eye is never reopened no uh, so the neurotrauma nerve um was damage so i can see on my left eye like i can see you clearly um not perfectly cl clear i cannot move it um above the horizon and uh to the right and left like hor uh perfect uh, uh efficiently so if you look at me um obviously listeners are just listening they can't see yeah, but I'm i can see if some goes on yeah paralyzed on this side okay I, so I have just no just yeah just just try it though, because like your your mouth is your mouth is moving fine, and your yeah, but yeah, just try the eye itself. Okay. Yeah. So um, with with that, um, it that was not uh, the priority initially, um, and and in fact for a very very long time, um, because I there, you know there were other other issues with with the brain, the the memory and the cognition. Um, but also the appetite. I never, um, you know, from the time of the hit, my appetite, I just had, I couldn't, I couldn't force food and, um, it led to extreme weight loss and to the, to the point where my survival was questionable. And, um, I was taught, uh, taken to, from neurotrauma hospital to, I needed treatment for the eating and um yeah just all of the complexities moving between seven different hospitals and that lasted for 26 months until finally i was um released <laughs> from denver colorado so from germany i was in between hospitals and then uh, from germany i was briefly taken to canada actually to a treatment center in guelph ontario but i was too far gone for what they could accommodate uh, or that they could treat, and from there I was quickly um, taken to, flown to Denver, Colorado, where the last seven months I got my life back. Wow. That's a, so. <laughs> that's, a, that's a long tale. It's, so, it, it was so a how, long Yeah, a long it's, I bet yeah. it was. So how did, how did that lead to you being in, being in Kathmandu? Okay, so after, um, after Is this even longer? I got, Pardon me? 
this may be even long, even longer, eh? Even more complex. Yeah, oh, it, it's long. <laughs> <laughs> that's uh, fine. It's really long. Sorry. Um, no, that's fine. I I needed to sort out some uh, bureaucratic uh, concerns, um, issues, because I had been a Canadian teaching in Germany. Um, I didn't have a work permit anymore after that long in hospital. Uh, so I, without a work permit, permit, I couldn't live there anymore. So that was a bit of a challenge, just finding residency because I actually did not have Canadian residency. I had so given you had that a, you had a home in Germany, but nowhere to I you did. weren't allowed to be there. I, I I had an apartment, but while I was in hospital, it was given up. So my oh, dear okay. friends, actually from Switzerland, went and um, sort of uh, cleaned it out took some of my belongings and I didn't have a lot. Uh, my car was sold and um, yeah, the, the apartment was given up. So I just had a few bags at my friend's place in Switzerland and so I needed to sort out banking and residency. And then I just felt so lost. I just decided um, that I was going to take a year, take some time just to sort of digest yeah. All that just had gone down, and uh, it tried try to work towards accepting the fact that my life isn't going to be the same. You know. Yeah. Um, so I asked you. I was going to ask you. So while you while you were in before your injury, while you were in Germany and your friends in Switzerland, did you ever head up to the mountains in the height of the Alps, or just or think, always look up at them? Oh yeah. Oh, you were a yeah. mountain climber. Mountain climber before oh. this. Well, no, I wasn't a mountain climber by any means. You're a but hiker. I was very uh mountain running like running trail running okay. and bike cycling and yep. uh, um skiing so you know i when i when i say i was in such a dark place for so long because i thought 70 percent vision loss i'm not going to be able to go and ride yeah, my bike exactly anymore i'm not going to be able to hop in my car and put my skis in the back and my two different bikes on the roof and just go to the mountains because and yeah. so I felt like life's not worth living anymore. If I yeah. can't have that independence, I'm out of here. And so yeah. pulling out the tubes and just defying doctor's orders because I really didn't think that life, it was worth fighting for. Yeah. Only, only because of a handful of people. Been there. Uh, yeah. Medical experts and, and friends, family who didn't give up on me. That's the reason I'm here. That's so. good. That's, yeah, that's. That's just it's not part me, of the area. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I hear yeah. from a lot of people. That's just they need something to tell them that it's it's it's, it's not it's not over. Just because it yeah. sucks now, but this so you could so not convince me that at the time. That's for sure. Yeah, I can yeah. I can feel I can definitely feel that. So, but now you're now you're in Kathmandu, of all places, I am. and uh, yeah. you, didn't, you didn't you didn't see that coming, did you? When you were lying Absolutely in hospital. Absolutely not. Not a chance. So I um, I decided to one year in 13 different massifs. So um, sort of not circumnavigating. Obviously, there's a lot more than 13 massifs in the world. However, uh, what, is, what, is a, what is a massif? I don't even. Uh, like a, ra a mountain range. Okay. So the Canadian Rockies would be a massive. Okay. So the Himalaya, the Nepal Himalaya yeah, is a massive. Okay. So 13 different mountain ranges. Um, and when I got, came through Nepal the first time, I, there was something really special about it. Um, I was convinced to run my first mountain race ever. Um, which yeah. is called the Annapurna 100. So I had been less than 11 to about 10 months out of hospital and here I am running um, a mountain race in Nepal. <laughs> how is it? How is... With 70% vision loss and a body that I was so unfamiliar with because yeah. I had gone from healthy and fit, you know, before my, at the time of my accident, very active, to being so sick, so malnourished, um, you know, given a hand, less than a handful of days to survive. And then getting my weight restored, and uh, yeah, my body just went through so much significant change. Yeah. Not to mention seventy percent vision loss and running yeah. on trail. I so, uh, to get myself to the start line was huge. That was a mountain in itself. Yeah. Um, but with with some convincing, 
um, I got myself there and then I actually you know the stories our minds tell us can be pretty cruel can be pretty um, ridiculous yeah <laughs> in <laughs> respect um, but the stories my mind was telling me was you know uh, well, it wasn't going to be good it was but I really enjoyed that that challenge um, I, I if, if you can believe it just yeah. smiling mountains yeah. and uh, and making some connections like there were runners from from Nepal and also international and who's now become a good friend Richard who was hosting the race told me about uh, a race around Manaslu uh, Manaslu is the eighth highest mountain in the world oh, yeah. and it's a and there's a stage race just a couple of weeks after. So with with my experience with the Annapurna 100 um, and just the beauty of Nepal, the people specifically, I decided to to stay, to change my ticket. So flying to Australia got um, sort of put on hold. It got changed as life does. And I stayed and ran around Manaslu. Uh, so it's a, a stage race eight stages, uh, I think eight, seven stages, a number of stages. <laughs> yeah, don't, uh, don't ask me because I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, anyway, just, and that is when I really fell in love with this country um, and I knew I wanted to come back. So I continued after the race, uh, I continued to travel for that one year as I had um, laid out. So uh, yeah. from, from Nepal, I continued to New Zealand and then to South America and then I ended up back through Colorado where I went to thank the doctors to see and to thank the doctors who saved okay. my life, yeah. which is one of the most special, special moments of my story. Um, and then decided to continue to travel. I felt that after one year, I was just getting started. And when yeah. I say just get started, I mean, um, it was a year that I thought I needed, I wanted to, you know, just to get to know myself, uh, how things have changed. But after one year, I just felt like, okay, I'm just starting to accept the fact that I'm never going to see properly um, again, yeah. and I'm not going to be driving that car again. But that's but, okay. That's fine. But was, that's okay. And yeah. there's so much that I still can do. Exactly. So yeah. it took some time, and I and I often talk about that shift in perspective. Yeah. Like, and the mountain analogy of, you know, looking at a mountain – and and think you know you could look at it and think oh my gosh that's going to be so difficult everything about it is just a challenge or you could look at it and just imagine the possibilities like yeah. what could could happen and everything that could go right not go wrong exactly. so um yeah at that point sort of after one year when i really started to open up to start to talk about it and see the benefits of um of helping others um, by sharing my story and talking about, um, you know, the, the dark times and, and very honest about um, how I, you know, I craved control for so long and just letting that go. And when, you know, with brain injuries, the timeline, and I just expected all of these um, yeah. uh, boxes to tick because I'm yeah. very much, you know, I like to be organized and I want to know when this is going to happen. And, yeah. and I just... It, after that year, I just started to, I guess, to let go a little bit and to be more accepting. Yeah. Um, you know, the stages of the stages of acceptance. There's, it's not linear by any means, but no. uh, that first year, really, just traveling and being alone, meeting different people from around the world. Um, yeah, it just there was, there was a shift, a, a yeah. shift that I'm really thankful and. Um, yeah, I hope I hope others can uh, connect. Uh, to that perspective yeah. and i think they will i think they have mm -hmm. um I, I wanted to ask you about your about the challenges you face like when you're climbing and running but uh first the uh the the, 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 the hospital in denver so yes. what hospital was this and and you said there was such a that's an amazing part of your story such a special part of your story that you that you were like these doctors which just was amazing so can you yeah. just talk about talk about the hospital in denver and What's it sure. called? Uh, I like light up talking about Denver Health is the first hospital um, where I where I, I I truly feel they got my life back in. If um, the my the my head doctor there, I remember, and and I was so ill, like the the you, the memory. <laughs> sorry, is, sorry, is I don't mean that. You, you said the head doctor. Do you mean like your your doctor? Oh, or you mean the lead the lead doctor? <laughs> 
<laughs> no, no, that's how just... <laughs> But Dr. Meyer, um, he, he, I remember him talking about Everest, and, and this is just only, I've only come to realize this since then, but he talked about, um, you know, lifelines and, and the analogy of, you know, ropes on a mountain climbing, uh, whereas in the hospital, I required these tubes to feed me yeah. for my medication, to be nourished, to be monitored. And because I was, you know, I was, I was, I was, pulling them out. I, I was defying. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but it was really, you know, I had been tossed between so many specialists in Germany and then in Canada. I just felt so misunderstood um, that I think, you know, that darkness that I talked about is because I just felt so alone. Like I, I have no doubt people cared and they, they wanted to get me better. But um, I, I had just felt like nobody was really listening. Like it's not that I just uh, don't want to eat. You know, I just, there was just so much going on. And it was at Acute, which is a part of Denver Health, that I really felt understood like feel it really felt like they listened um they changed sort of my diagnosis because they were so specialized they realized that the trauma from my brain injury um affected you know uh, affected my appetite and and my issues I, with food I, and know, eating. I, I guess they so, see a lot of brain injuries and at that at the in the alps and the alps the rockies their hierarchies there in denver they probably still uh, have cs and cs and brain injuries there do they yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a yeah. number of hospitals, actually, that not a number, but a couple of really specialized hospitals um, in Denver. What where I was actually treated um, first was to was the eating, and yeah. but the thing is, is there were, like I had such a team, like they just made me feel like they they made connections between you know there was the psychology, the speech, the uh, physiotherapy, physical therapy. OT, like every day was just yeah. full of, of, Rehab stuff, of yeah. therapy while at the same time that they, um, acknowledge, you know, were, were treating my, my eating. So, um, for so long there had been a conflict between what I wanted and what I needed yet at acute, like at, at Denver health, they really, um, they, they coddled that connection, um, or sort of that conflict with, with connection. They just, you know, relating my story or my my wants to to lifelines, to being you know ropes on a mountain, and and no one ever summits or or climbs a mountain alone. Like uh, when when Dr. Mailer was talking, would talk about Everest. You know, no one just goes from the base from base camp to the summit by themselves. You know, they need a team, they need support, and for so long I wasn't welcoming that support. But as yeah. soon as I started to feel like um, listened to and understood like the psychologists just really really listening then um you know then magic started to happen you know i the re recovery uh with that team everyone from like i i said the the, the physical therapy the nurses and uh, you know my struggles every time they would come in with a new bag of medication or a new bag of of nutrition which I w was struggled yeah. with, you know, just um, really, really connecting with me and um, through my through my tears, you know, they just they didn't give up and and um, uh, I'm just trying to think. Of, oh yeah, and and speech therapy, you know, um, with my brain injury, there was yeah. um, the, the my limits in terms of speech and writing and stuttering. Like I would, I just get so frustrated, but. But they were just so so patient with me. Um, I I remember like nurses uh, Stephanie like just just talking to me about real things, and then Remy the therapy dog, um, you know, just the whole team that made made me feel human, you know, yeah. not just a a patient in a hospital, um, but telling me she went horseback riding on the weekend or bringing the therapy dog I, I remember the first time that the the dog from the ward came in it was a golden lab and i just started to cry yeah. because it was like something before the accident that i was used to like it was familiar it was normal for me to see dogs at the farm or dogs at my parents place my um you know 
it, it just felt human. So I just feel like um, at Denver Health, you know, when I could really focus, I felt I felt connections and um, I could really – there was just a shift where I could focus yeah. on my retreat. Well, it sounds, it sounds, does sound like that was a very important place for you and uh but and you were talking about support and they're mm-hmm. talking about support going up and everyone needs support going up and down mountains and uh so what support do you find you need now it does very serendipity uh yeah. it fits well <laughs> works well on yeah. this uh this conversation too um yeah. what support do you need do you, or do you need any when you're doing your trail runs or your climbing i've seen the you sent me some amazing pictures of of okay. you summoning the mm-hmm. the mountain called am uh the I'm mountain a I'm a yeah. I'm a that yes. was just two weeks that was just two weeks. and yeah. uh and you were done with the trail the trail runs you went i was on your on your web page yeah. of three thousand meters four thousand meter race and stuff yeah. so uh so uh she's telling us tell about any challenges you find and support do you get when running sure. and when mountain climbing yeah. Yeah, um, it's really, uh, again, it's surreal because I never imagined that I'd be able to have independence and and um, uh, running. I do most of the time I'm running by myself. Um, I can see well enough that trails are best um, in ways. In the tra- like trails like in, in, in the woods and stuff? Yeah. Are you okay, because- you're okay with that? when I'm not in uh, because I can relax in terms of no bicycles, no motorbikes okay. no cars coming from my right especially right. so um, so you can you know, see like can... you see you can see roots and and yeah. the sticks well, and broad rocks yeah. and stuff um, yeah so it's kind of a, a bit of a catch 22 because in the trails yeah I can see I can see usually um, some rocks, some roots but I have no depth perception so yeah, I for to, to see you know to see with depth perception you need to your two eyes work together yeah yeah when you, when you don't have that everything's kind of flush yeah i've definitely um because of amazing therapists and a lot of training and time i've definitely adjusted um yeah the, the most difficult for me is running downhill Okay. Well, running, walking downhill because you know because because I can't necessarily judge the depth. I, uh, I have a lot of scars that could tell story. You know, my hands, <laughs> my knees can tell stories. Yes. Um, because of the falls and that first year of traveling, there was a lot of broken sunglasses. Yeah. And, and not only because of the fall, but because if I fell and my sunglasses went flying, I was angry. I was yeah. so frustrated, you know, that talking about my work to uh, towards acceptance and, um, you know, I was still caught up in anger and this frustration of losing so much of my vision and the the autonomy of of the you know athlete that I was before. So it took. Um, yeah, that first year, like if I fell and there were sunglasses, it might be because I stepped on them on purpose because I was just angry. I was not. It was not nice. But I, with time and acceptance and just getting used to, um, the falls don't happen quite as often. Um, and I say that probably with friends listening who are laughing, um, particularly <laughs> in our on Abu Dhabi last week. Uh, you know, the going downhill. Um, Side note: Amadablam is known around the world for being one of the most technical mountains, uh, specifically in the in the Himalayas, one of them, if not the most technical climb. So uh, it, it that's a, a challenge in itself. But going up to um, 6,000 uh, 6, meters, but coming down for me is in more difficult in in yeah. some ways respects. So the big boulders specifically, um, when I can't judge the distance between them, I just follow red shoes. <laughs> and that's a bit of a joke because my friend who was actually guiding me, he always wore, uh, once we got our big boots off, he wore red shoes. And it's really helpful for me to watch someone's feet on the downhill. Did you, did you ask him to wear a red shoe, like a big, no, a bright no, color, no. a bright color, or he just did it? No, he just had these red shoes, and and it became somewhat of a joke. Um, but 
it, yeah, so just to watch watch his feet. Or if I'm running with someone, I always ask them for two reasons, to run ahead of me when we're going downhill so I can watch their feet because uh, I it helps a little bit with my confidence. Um, if I can, you know, if I know that they can, they're, they're sort of, uh, dancing on those stones, then I, I know I can do it. Um, and then, um, sorry, what was the other thing I was going to say? Uh, watching feet. Depth perception. Yeah. Depth perception. Sorry. Sometimes that happens. Oh, sorry. I've interrupted I've interrupted you a bell bunch, so don't worry about it. No, that's okay. Um, That's okay. Uh, but yeah, there's just a... watching someone else's feet is um, is super helpful, and and pointing out like with with that and rock climbing, like when I'm uh, on a, a rock climbing wall, for example, it's I obviously I miss everything that's on my right if I don't make a uh, right. yeah. conscious effort to completely turn my head. So if someone's belaying me, it's super helpful when they point out, oh, you know, take a look, there's something up on your right or or um, move your feet, that kind of thing. It's it's really so it, helpful. It does um, take takes, do, takes you know, that bit that bit longer to move your head. Takes that bit longer okay. to move your entire head than yeah, just like your eye. For sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. So is yeah, that so? Yeah. So you don't. So you, when you're doing races, you don't. You can just when you're. I don't know how races like mm-hmm. if you mm-hmm. use the them totally by yourself, like through the woods, yeah. um, by yeah. yourself, and just kind of hope or. Just not yeah. hope, but just kind of like, just assume there's no, which is just dangerous. <laughs> but you know. Yeah. No, nothing. I'm not. I'm uh, since those those first couple of races, it, um, I've you know I've participated in other running events where where I'm with groups, but no, I I don't run for the competitive component at all. Uh, when I talk about mountains of my mind, that's sort of how it started, like running in mountains, and that's sort of where I feel that's essentially my best therapy just being in the mountains and and running and i sort sort i i say i sort out the world's problems when i'm running on trails um but i i just mean like sorting out my thoughts and yeah and how feeling how i'm doing with respect to acceptance and then and then just daily things in terms of um being at peace with myself and somewhat somewhat of a uh, meditative state when i run yeah um, no i yeah sorry Sorry, it's great. No, I I just get to a point uh, physically where where it's um, yeah I can I can tune out most of the time and sometimes it does mean I end up on the ground because I'm not yeah. focused enough. But uh, yeah, I think that can, it could happen to other people too. <laughs> I think that's just it's just it's, inc- it's incredible how listening to your story and I know like my my story like if you have a. Seventy percent of your vision, so your 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 right eye is 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 uh, basically basically shut. And yeah. uh, for me, I have double vision, and uh, and uh, but I so it's not the same vision problems, but like some of the similar ones, like that perception is a challenge. Um, mm. And uh, and I know, and just even and even and, uh, and even our physical challenges were were different. Like I didn't have problems like eating. I guess I did the first when I was in coma. When I was in coma, I just kind of coma. Actual leading, I guess, but uh, I've the other physical challenges, that, and you had other challenges, so it's just different. And uh, again, if you were saying before, as you were saying earlier, that it's just unique, unique to everybody that what a brain injury does do. But we all, and even the people I've talked to on like the Montreal concussion, the McGill, the students concussion, I don't want to, the whole name is long, but U of T and McGill and, and Lawrence, Lawrence Ix in Utah, and, and Katie Mitchell. All these people who came to them, it doesn't have brain injury, but uh, but the people end up with the similar, end up in the similar state of mind, the similar mindfulness. That's they that kind of like, not that you live. Everyone says, oh, you live less, you live life to have less. But it's not like you don't like live life and you like you accept, you appreciate every day more. It's not like that. It's just that it's it's just there's a different sense of how it's I don't know how it all works together, how everything works together like some days they're still not going to be great because you're just like like say for example it's outside it's gray and it's raining and there's it's not much to do so i'm probably not going to do much i'll do a bit but i mean that's part of it and like this and i can like i'll do all these i'll do, do this stuff i'll get my podcast pretty there and stuff and i'm sure there are days in the poly even though i'll be gorgeous it is but there are days and you're just like i'm just 
not going to, this is just nothing else really happened there, what did you say? Oh, I didn't do much. And that's pretty much, that's how it is, but it's not like you live each day like to the fullest, like I was saying, but that you accept that it all works together and it's all, yeah. it's all yeah. something that's, you don't need to have a goal per se, but just know that it's moving, you're moving in the right direction and, and you like the way it's moving, so you can appreciate it that way, I guess. So I'm rambling yeah. here because I'm just th trying to think my thoughts out loud, running through them. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah. No, I right. Like so many lessons from my brain injury. And, and I know like that, like I said before, every day is not going to be pretty mountain pictures, but I'm aware now. Like I know if, if I'm having a bad day, I know it's going to pass. Like exactly. Uh, impermanence is something that I really, really hold on to. Like, yeah, it, it's okay to have bad days, and sometimes there'll be more than you know, more than a handful yeah, at a time. Yeah. But I know that things will get better, and I know that you know the the lessons from my brain injury and the time in hospital. That yeah, it's uh, they prepared me for this. You know, they prepared me for eight months of lockdown. That that time of darkness. I I know that how bad it was, and I wouldn't wish it upon anyone. Exactly. But it doesn't have. To, it's not going to last forever. Exactly. It's just like I think the impermanence is very important. Even like I know like you've been away from North America for a little while, but uh, the uh, anger stuff here that like like I've 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 been like you get mad you get mad at someone, but it's just like you know that you say oh, okay I'm mad at you now, but this will pass. But I mean yeah. it's just right now I'm just pissed. But like you know talk to me an hour later or whatever. I'm totally fine. It's like. It's just something that happens just like you know me now and like and then that's it's over then yeah. it's just just an emotion that happened it's just but anyway i uh that's my little i'm just rambling here because i'm thinking i'm thinking out loud but uh <laughs> but uh you you are at mountains of mountains of your mind to be talking about that's actually the name of yours which want to on skype now and i will actually i never do this but i usually skype on this because jill is in can do. I'm in St. John's Newfoundland, and uh, the connection has been surprisingly just, I don't say flawless, but pretty much flawless. I mean, it's been like, hey. so, I mean, it's, it's, it's very impressive. And, uh, but anyway, sorry, mountains of your mind. Mountains uh, of my mind. Mountains of yeah. oh, my mind. Um, so, yeah. where can people reach you and find out more about your journeys now? Now you're down, I'm a, I'm a Dublin. You're, you finished that, but uh, that's, that's there. And that will yeah. I'll have pictures of that on my Instagram page, um, sure. and Jill has that on her Facebook page as well. So, how can people reach you and find out more about your story and what you're doing? Well, anyone is more than welcome to explore my website. So it's Mountains of My Mind, and then I have all of the social media that goes with it. Um, there's a Facebook page called Mountains of My Mind um, on Instagram. Uh, it's, I think they don't let me use the whole, it's too long. So it's, it's MTNS yeah. at of my mind, MTNS. Yeah. Short form for mountains, which is, I think is, which is also the same for Twitter. Um, I, in Instagram, uh, I've been using more because it's quick, but I, I have a lot of writing and reflecting to do based on my last, like I, uh, we alluded to, I just came back from Ahmed album. So that was five months or not five months, five weeks. Um, I have just got back, so I haven't had a chance to do any publishing, any writing about it yet, but that will get up there. So if you go to mountains of my mind, my website, all of the links for the social media are on there. Um, there's lots of pictures, lots of writing, and um, a contact page. So I'm more than happy to to share my story more, to answer any questions, whether it be specifically about brain injury, vision loss, eating disorders, you name it, everything that's come in the wake of, of September 3rd, 2014, I'm happy to talk about. Um, mental health, I'm, I'm really open to sharing, and I believe it. To, it needs more time um, in society today. So yeah, yeah, I'm happy to talk about that. And um, yeah, whether it be um, the website or any of my social media, I'm happy to to connect. And even if I don't get back right away, it's only probably because I'm in the mountains, but I definitely will personally respond to every contact that is made with me. That's, that's yeah. great. And also all of your accounts will be linked in my 
in my post on my website and uh, on Instagram and Facebook, and hopefully it'll just you'll search Jill's Mountains or MTS MTMS of my mind or Mountains of my mind on Facebook, and uh, and the web check out the website too MountainsOfMyMind.com, and uh, so I just want to thank Jill again for the, the, the again like this Kevin due to St John's connection has been I'm impressed and. Uh, and Jill, a little, little small apartment there, but uh, well, I'm not gonna rack it with my my microphone against my my uh, sweatshirt zipper. But uh, that's annoying. But anyway, that's beside the point. But <laughs> uh, so yeah, so thanks, Angel, and uh, I hope that uh, people check out and check out your website and your Facebook and Instagram and your Twitter. And uh, I'm speaking too quickly for myself. So a good thing. One thing I have to learn is when to slow down my speaking my speech. And uh, I will do it now, and I will thank you again, and I'll slow down and say goodbye, Jill. And thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me, Nick. The music at the beginning of this podcast is by Ben Sound. www.bensound.com.